during the course of the POV, uh, we would be um, pulling out certain pull questions that would appear um, within the chat window, and we request you all to kindly participate in the same. Our POV today is focused on building bridges, strengthening the MNC University collaborations, right? In an increasingly connected and rapidly evolving world, a collaboration between MNCs and universities has become imperative. These partnerships hold immense potential to drive innovation, enhance research capabilities, and create a meaningful impact on the larger society. We at Zinov are not new to building these bridges between MNC and universities. Over the course of years, we've been talking about the importance of this and advising organizations on having the best strategy around this. However, we have realized that and there is a significant shift recently in the way that GCCs are collaborating with universities, where the focus is more on driving sustained, sustained engagements rather than having siloed interventions that happen at some point of the time of the year, but moving, moving on from that into a much more sustained engagement methodology. At the core of this webinar, the belief is that collaboration between MNCs and universities has the power to fuel economic growth, drive innovation, and empower the next generation of talent. To begin with, we focused on understanding the global picture of MNC university collaborations, right? The key anchor globally was research uh, because this is the most prominent collaboration methodology between corporates and in uh, the academia. So, um, like I said, uh, the anchor was on uh, research and we went about assessing the global corporate funding of university research across a region, across various regions, be it the Americas, the Central Europe and the Asia sector. And to do this, we looked into the top ranking research universities in each of these regions, which are generally ranked based on their competency in research and map the investments that they've received in the last five years, predominantly before the pandemic till now, right? And what we've realized is this is a, there's almost more than a billion dollars invested uh, by the MNCs to the research arm of these universities. The rise in the corporate funding for the university uh, research and development signifies the increasing recognition of valuable role that academia plays today in driving innovation and solving complex industry challenges. And these investments focus on accelerated innovation and economic growth, as well as knowledge exchange and talent development. It's prevalent across all regions across the globe. Over the years, multiple products and solutions have emerged from these long-term committed MNC partnerships with the universities. Let's just take an example of the Apple Watch. Through the Apple Heart study that happened almost a decade ago, Stanford Medicine Researcher shows wearable technology can help detect atrial fibrillation. And this, in fact, led to the development of the ECG button on today's current Apple Watches. And looking at the automotive hub in the Europe, we have the combination of the collaboration between BMW and Technical University of Munich, working on one of the brand's first electric vehicle, the BMW i3, which was a breakthrough in terms of its innovative use of lightweight materials and sustainable production methods, and also included an immense focus on battery tech and autonomous driving. And closer home, we have the Koreans focusing on the next gen um, uh, handheld technologies and predominantly we have the uh, example of Samsung collaborating with Seoul National University uh, and within development of uh, within the fields of semiconductors displays and telecommunications which has led to the development of flexible OLED displays that can be built and folded without breaking. I'm sure all of us have seen access some of these through a period of time but the recent pandemic kind of showcased the real strength of universities' capability to the world, right? Universities today have played an important and a crucial role in the development of COVID vaccines. The scientific expertise, research capabilities, and collaborative spirit have been instrumental in advancing vaccine research development process across various stages. We have the example from the Americas where the Johnson & Johnson vaccine Janssen was 
predominantly uh, worked upon by Harvard's Medical Center, where they looked into the preclinical development of the vaccine by working alongside Johnson & Johnson scientists. The most famous AstraZeneca vaccine, the Covishield. The uh, Oxford group was primarily responsible for the developing of the entire vaccine technology where AstraZeneca was just focused on manufacturing and distribution and clinical trials. And more closer home, Bharat Biotech collaborated with uh, All Indian Institute of Medical Sciences, AIMS, Delhi, to, for the evaluation of Covaxin's uh, vaccination safety and immunogenicity, and also looked at uh, monitoring trial participants and assessing immune responses. And more closer, shifting focus towards India. India has been one of the fastest growing economies in the world, has attracted sizable number of GCCs over the years, and it continues to grow at the rate of 5% CAGR. And we still have a solid presence of 1,570 plus GCCs in the Indian ecosystem as of 2022. And this is primarily led by the massive installed talent that's available in India and also the vibrant fresh workforce that is fueling engineering and product innovation, right? And we, on, on the other hand, when we take a look at the university ecosystem, which has almost 2.5 million plus STEM talent and graduates and, and approximately um, 780,000 are relevant for the GCC industry. This is looking at both the immediate relevance for ERD as well as the other sporting functions. Once we assess the entire Indian GCC ecosystem, um, we try to map the GCCs based on the Zinov's maturity model, right? So Zinov's maturity model is uh, divided into four stages predominantly based on the type of work done, which is the outpost is the least mature stage, the satellite being the medium mature portfolio and the transformation hub being the highest mature stage. And to overlap the entire GCC ecosystem across these maturity stages, we see that almost 57% contribute to the first two stages, the outpost and the satellite, and the portfolio hub is around 37% of the overall GCCs, whereas a bare minimum of 5% of GCCs lie within the transformational hub. Overlapping this on the, uh, uh, the overview of where are the presence of ecosystem engagements, we see that the current assessment of the GCCs are focusing on high partnerships with the universities irrespective of where they lie within the maturity model compared to even compared to the startup or the government institutions and within the developer ecosystem amongst all four, the universities are the ones that predominantly stand out as an easier ecosystem engagement partner, right? And these partnership models are typically anchored on five key focus areas, which is the sponsored infrastructure, training and curriculum, consulting, open research, and outcome-based partnerships, right? So we went a step further and kind of unbundled the programs executed under those five anchors based on maturity of these individual programs. So we kind of put together, uh, let's say the way to read this particular slide would be to look at, you know, Outpost predominantly focuses on, and the GCC in the Outpost category predominantly focuses on talent acquisition, whereas the one in the satellite focuses on talent acquisition plus the rest of training and mentorship, sponsored events, knowledge sessions. So the way we see these programs are also, they are arranged in the form of the increasing maturity to the right, as, as well as the way the GCCs are assessed. Over the years, the GCCs have traditionally focused on driving university collaboration programs based on short-term goals, and hence unable to achieve a higher value. We've seen a lot more organization just predominantly focused on talent acquisition, thereby driving minimal value, whereas compared to the ones that are driving sponsored research and open research. And these are, again, uh, the ones that are in the higher maturity stage that are dominantly looking at that. Higher value can typically be achieved by driving mature programs at the earlier stages itself, which is why 
we see that a couple of recent trends showcases that that these partnerships are evolving today within the gccs and the universities where there's a lot of emphasis on current co creation which predominantly focuses on research and development of joint projects incubation and startup support um we all we you know uh, this is to support the entrepreneurial ventures and startups within the um the universities and uh, industries are coming and participating in providing guidance for these individual um startups that are incubated internally at the university level right and also um access to shared research facilities and resources we all know that you know when we take take an account of the test bed 5g test bed there's only one or two in india uh, and these are shared across a lot of companies as well as universities so a uh, co creation has been a lot uh, has been given a lot of emphasis of late and also dedicated focus areas to build that healthy talent pipeline right so we have hackathons and innovation challenges the outcomes of these lead to typical research problem research pipeline ideas and also pocs that can change the game for uh the industry while working with the uh, academia and we also look at technology transfer and licensing where gccs collaborate with academia to identify ip and innovative technologies and leverage them from the academic institutions and also obviously looking at the industry academia conferences where uh, these events are of great importance for the industry to facilitate knowledge sharing and networking with the like minded professors as well as the other industry partners the another important important aspect is the social impact contribution that a lot more gccs are today are working towards enabling them for the organized the larger ecosystem right so what exactly is the social impact, uh, impact contribution so which predominantly looks at focusing on skill development and training uh which can design and deliver where the industry design and deliver relevant training programs and workshops to help bridge the skill gap and equip students with the necessary knowledge and skills for the employment in gccs they are also focusing on curriculum development um uh, within different aspects of uh, the in the in with for example within the engineering for different semesters within the engineering so that when these students go through these particular focused curriculum they are almost industry ready to be absorbed into the into the organization itself so these couple of factors are kind of driving an increased collaboration today and we see there's a significant uptake in terms of the investments as well and this currently has led to a gcc is becoming more strict more and more strategic about how they leverage these particular partnerships right so previously it was all predominantly done in silos but today due to the constant evolvement gcc are looking at more strategic ways to collaborate even before they finalize a list of programs in terms of what they need to drive they are also looking at the scale and impact and what is the proximity to business is assessed for each of the individual program what we have done here um from the now as we have kind of mapped the list of programs based on the ability to capture intrinsic and extrinsic value to the organization uh, and um, and also club these two together uh let's say for example the sponsored research the open research and the academic accelerators those three are clubbed together just to indicate that these are some of the high impact programs and which could be a part of your core competency as well as the adjacent competency so group programs based on the key anchors that can drive research that can drive probably you know uh, we have the uh, talent acquisition and branding aspect as one and training and curriculum as one and consulting and creating a research idea pipeline on driving innovation and university hackathons as a pipeline for your larger research engagements what are then we kind of moved on to understand what are the typical elements of success in driving academic programs first and the foremost is obviously the leadership buy in whether it's local and global it is of high importance that organizations focus on having the significant buying today we have 
examples of companies driving and setting up programs in India and almost taking it globally. So it's important to have a vision and also a leadership buy-in because some of these programs have generally take a long time to have a return on investment. So as well as in terms of the value creation, academic collaborations are not really structured in a way that you see return immediately. So an essential buy-in at, at the highest level and a constant exposure to drive this change is very important across all of these uh, programs, right? The second aspect is the presence of dedicated university relations team. Um, I'll come back to the deep dives. And the third is the measuring the right outcomes. And four, again, stage gating your entire decision making and funding to development. So these essentially are your elements of success. Focusing on the having the right university relations structure. We see that um, the most common and the basic structure in many organizations uh, is the one that's 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 said on the left side of your screen, where um, uh, there are a couple of SPOCs within the BUs reaching out to the university for research activities. And these folks also are in constant touch with the talent acquisition for any recruiting requirements. And these SPOCs also drive branding and communication individually and depending upon the context that's required. However, we've seen the majority of the companies, the mature companies adopt a more university relations lead model, right? Where this individual would have complete responsibility to talk to the universities externally, as well as run the entire internal communication and the requirements internally. So this would be a central individual with with one or two um, uh, persons assisting in this, so where you have the entire requirement of the, uh, the entire aspect of the HR and the TA and the branding having um, or driving out responsibilities from one end, as well as managing expectations from the individual views where folks such as where folks are identified as alumni icons and, and they drive the individual uh, discussions along with the university, university relations lead with the institutions. And what we see here are the typical KRAs of the university relations team is to identifying the typical needs of the organization requirements, managing the database and assets, typically track your scorecards based on the programs that you conduct and run, and also have a view on the ROI analysis of the existing programs build business cases and see overall, see, um, you know, um, oversee all communications and the change management initiatives. The other most important aspect is also to monitor your key business outcomes for long-term success. Right? We look at the tactical outcomes across looking at your talent acquisition metrics, number of people recruited, joining ratio, attrition within the six months to one year of joining. And a list of these matrices are typically identified when you run a set of talent acquisition programs. When you run, uh, similarly, when on the other side of the spectrum, when you run the research aspect within the uh, uh, collaborations, you also look at mapping them to the number of active projects, number of IPs generated, project completion, budget variance, et cetera, number of patents filed, number of research. So typically uh, the tracking of certain tactical matrices is extremely important for collaborative success. And also of course, an essential part of it would be for looking at these strategic metrics, such as, you know, what are the cost savings enabled, reduction to time and hire, POCs developed, IP generated, and so on and so forth. In a nutshell, a tracking of matrices has a, a phenomenal, gives a phenomenal view in terms of elements that are required for successful collaborations. We at Zinov have put together a proprietary framework that looks at a stage-gated process where we kind of look at the entire um, university collaboration program in two phases. The first phase, typically the ideate and design, where we kind of understand the organization's priorities, future goals, plans, and map the expectations. So typically align the entire expectation and conduct an immersion workshop 
uh, to assess the current state across the individual programs, be it the talent acquisition program or your branding and engagement program or your research program within that individual sub programs. And we also bring in a view of, um, you know, benchmarking towards some of the industry best uh, to get an outside in perspective and come up with the blueprint that's relevant for your organization, right? So there's a completed stage gate process that Zinov looks at helping organizations to put together their collaboration model with the academia. We also have a phase two, which is predominantly focusing on the implementation of these recommendations. That's, that's, that pretty much comes out from your blueprint design. And I would like to conclude, uh, I would like to pretty much conclude my uh, POE with looking at where does your problem statements lie today? How are you looking at the scope of impact, the proximity to business, and how are you planning to drive strategic value for your organization in terms of industry-university collaborations? Thank you.